a little bit earlier today um uh, that we had a little discussion and uh i myself uh pray for those uh with the water and uh just sitting here thinking about all the things that mother earth is uh kind of guiding us to show us how to work together and uh, i'm i'm hearing different elders in my in my head say you know it's uh time for us it's been time for us to come together as a people and to go to come back into sacred law and so i just want to leave with that we um in about 10 minutes we will have gloria many gray horses go she's going to come on and share with us a little bit what's happening uh on uh, facebook and uh some other other things so i'm looking forward to that we're going to play a song and we'll be back after this uh these two messages now we're going to catch an old freight train out of Seattle, Washington. And we're going to ride her all the way to New York City. Hop on the train and take the journey down that long, dusty road with me, Annabelle, every Tuesday afternoon on Folkin' Around, only on Chaos 89.3 FM, featuring folk music old and new and highlighting local artists. That's Tuesdays, 1 to 3 p.m. on Chaos, your listener-supported community radio station. This train's a leaving. Come aboard. For more than 30 years, the Nisqually Reach Nature Center has offered environmental education to thousands of youth and young adults at Lure Beach in Olympia, Washington. The Nature Center is a volunteer-run, membership-supported, nonprofit organization that promotes the understanding, appreciation, and preservation of the Nisqually Estuarine ecosystem. At the Nisqually Reach Nature Center, there are four saltwater tidal aquariums filled with crabs, sea stars, anemones, and other marine animals that live in the waters of South Puget Sound. The center provides field trip opportunities, supplemental classroom activities, and summer camps, all aimed at sharing the beauty and uniqueness of the Nisqually Estuary while sharing the values of conservation, particularly with regards to South Puget Sound. For more information, contact 360-459-0387 or go to www.nisqualiestuary.org.
and that was Mr. Robert Guerrero, and that song is uh, sacred. And um, we got a few folks on the line, and I'm still waiting for Deloria to give us a call. But um, until she does, uh, um, hello. 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 How are you? I'm all right. And we'll just get uh, folks to to introduce yourself, and uh, when Deloria kind of uh, gets here, we'll, we'll we can start now. So. Thanks for uh, sharing with us. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on in Facebook and around uh, native names. And, uh, again, this is KAOS 89.3 FM. This is Raven Redbone. And I think Deloria's with us. Hello? Delo- Deloria? Hello? Are you there? Hi. Hi. How you doing, Brad? Huh? Good, good. I think we got everybody now. So oh, perfect. I'll let everybody introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Thanks uh, for calling. Jackie, are you there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, my name is Jacqueline Keeler, and I am uh, I am a Navajo in Yankton, Dakota, and I live here in Portland, Oregon, and I am a co-founder of the uh, group Eradicating Offensive Native Masketry. Thank you. Hi, I'm Deloria Many Gray Horses, and on my mom's side, I come from the Kainai Nation. It's a band of the Blackfoot Confederacy. And on my dad's side, I'm um, Yankton, um, Dakota, and Chickasaw. And I'm calling in from Calgary, um, Alberta. Thank you. Uh, hi, and I'm Kayla Faith Duval. I'm originally from Pennsylvania, but I now live in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Shawnee and Potawatomi Indian. Um, I came into contact with Jackie during a protest of the Cleveland Indian mascots in, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm currently an engineer in Cleveland. Thank you. I think we got And my name is uh, Jean Louis Gris. I'm originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, calling in from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I'm a member of the Tunica Biloxi tribe. For my tribe, I do uh, language and culture preservation work. I also uh, work for the FAB Foundation, which is a nonprofit started at MIT. Thank you. And um, I know we're going to be talking today a little bit about Native American mascot issue, and I, I appreciate everybody uh, sharing today. And uh, and I know recently, Deloria, that the, some of the, the problems that you have uh, occurred on Facebook. So can we talk a little bit about what ha- what happened and what's going on? Um, sure, yeah. Um, well, on April 13th, I, I woke up and I was going through my uh, Facebook news feed and I saw an article um, um, that was featured in Indian Country. And in the article, it was, um, they, there was a, a marching band from the Biloxi High School in Mississippi and um, all of the students, um, uh, part of their uniform was they were wearing um, northern style um, headdresses. And so, and they're also their mascot is the Indian. And I just kind of remember, I was like, oh my gosh, this is 2015. I, I was really concerned with um, that it was a place of learning. Um, it's, it's not like it was hipsters at, a, at Coachella or, or a, a fashion model, but it was, um, these are young people. And, and so I, I was pretty upset and I shared the article on Facebook. And I had, there was a community member up here in Calgary, and she was like, you know, you should, you should call down there and, and um, let the principal know or the superintendent. So I called down, and um, I wasn't able to get in touch with anyone at the school, but I did leave a message for the superintendent. And the community member um, suggested, you know, she's like, why stop there? Keep going with it. So um, I started a petition. And I reached out to, to my father, um, Phil Lane, and he suggested that I get in touch with my cousin, um, Jackie, who is a long, long-time standing advocate on the issue. And, um, and so I was able to get connected, and, and that was really great. Um, there, there are, it, this is definitely a, a, collective, um, a collective movement, and um, I've been able to learn a lot um, through that. And... Maybe I could pass it over to um, to Jackie, maybe to share a little bit about the work that she's doing and to give maybe a little bit of background about um, the issue. Sure. 
Yeah. Um, hi, I'm, um, I got, I've been involved with the uh, Not Your Mascot um, movement. I was part of a group, I'm part of a group called Eradicating Offensive Native Masketry. And um, I made up the word masketry to um, describe all the um, practices that go with having a native mascot. I think that um, people, when we just focus on the mascot, people um, lose sight of everything that the mascot, the stereotypes the mascot promotes. Um, you know, playing Indian, wearing red face, doing fake Indian chants, and really, you know, having a sense of entitlement to our ident identity that it breeds um, in other Americans. And uh, so, um, and then uh, we formed our group and we started a hashtag called Not Your Mascot. And uh, we, we um, first showed it um, over the Super Bowl last year and we trended nationally. And uh, so um, we've been really active using social media to draw attention to um, native issues of, um, of appropriation, of red face. Um, we also did Not Your Tonto during the Oscars and Not Your Tiger Lily. And we, and we also um, coordinated a D-Chief um, Twitter storm. And in each of these, we reach between 15 million and 22 million timelines in one night. So we can use, um, like, hash, track, um, hash Tracker and other um, applications to track the hashtag and how it, how it goes over a 24-hour period. And, um, and so we do reach a lot of people. And, and I, I think I was telling um, <laughs> Deloria that it's funny to see, like, NFL players quoting my tweets. You, don't, you never know where they're going to go. And we might only be 1% of the population, but we, uh, we organize, we can be heard. And this is really something new. Um, you know, in the past, we've, um, you know, my parents began protesting against the Cleveland Indians when I was, before I was born. Um, they first started protesting as part of the Cleveland Indian community um, in 1968. And um, you know, there was like a very young Native community there. They were brought there by relocation which was a part of a program of terminating tribes and relocating the population to urban centers like Cleveland. And um, that was passed by Congress in the 1950s. And, um, and so they were, um, they were there with about 20,000 young Native people, and they really began organizing to get rid of the Cleveland Indian mascot. And so it's been five decades, <laughs> wow. and there's still work. I went back. I, got, I had the opportunity to go back to Cleveland, um, and that's where I met Kayla. And... Um, and I, um, it was really wonderful to see the community there and, and to see that they still haven't lost the spirit to, to get rid of Chief Wahoo. And, um, and it's sad that it's taken this long. I mean, I really thought this was something that would go away on its own. And to see these things being given new life um, for another generation, when, when young people like children are exposed to these mascots, these stereotypes, like, um, you know, the squaw stereotype that um, Adam Sandler is promoting in his film, um, you know, it, they carry that throughout their lives. We're basically continuing these negative stereotypes for until the end of the 21st century because children today will be alive until the end of the century. And uh, we really want them to end. Uh, we, uh, you know, they um, unlock so many powerful ideas about us. Um, Native women have the highest... Um, you know, uh, rates of rape in the Department of Justice report in 2010. Um, I, it was like three and a half times the rate of rape and murder. And in some counties, the rate for Native women is nine times that of other American women. And this includes all races. We, you know, our rate of rape is three times that of African American women. And uh, and a lot of this is due to assaults by white men. Seventy percent of the attacks on Native women are done by white men. And these are crime statistics. And um, so, you know, if we weren't being assaulted by white men, our statistics would be more, would be in line with that of other, of other American women. Right. And, and I, so it's, yeah, so it shows the power these stereotypes have. No, I just, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just started thinking about how uh, you know, I talked to a, a father of one of the ladies uh, who just was uh, murdered, uh, Misty Upham, and, uh, and how they go on to the native land and they do this and they leave and they're not prosecuted and that has to change too to where where um they can be prosecuted and be taken in uh and tried for for the crimes that they're doing yeah i mean it's i yeah the whole misty Evans thing is just it's it's it, it, you know our community is in so much pain because of these assaults done to us and they're never that we don't get um, the authority to ever 
take them seriously. I mean, um, the reason the Violence Against Women Act was passed uh, to increase um, you know, tribal jurisdiction over non-Indians was because the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation was refusing, uh, was declining to investigate over 70% of uh, rapes and murders on the reservation. And, um, and, and so it's, um, yeah, it's a very, there's a huge, um, we need to confront these stereotypes. And, um, and, and, you know, the fact that our names are, are not taken seriously on Facebook and uh, that any person who has a beef with a Native person can report them and get them silenced, um, that was really shocking to me. I mean, it's, it's really the extent of, um, you know, of all these ridiculous ideas that were um, promoted during, um, the, you know, during the closing of the West, the Vanishing Indian, you know, the Wild West shows, and then into these Hollywood movies. Um, they're still very much what we deal with. I mean, when I meet, um, often when I meet people who don't, they're shocked to meet a Native person. Um, you know, they think that we, you know, they ask, ask ridiculous questions. And um, it, it shows that we, um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and social media is the first time we've had an actual medium where we have a lot of control over it. Absolutely. I hear, I, I've said this before on, on the air a lot. I take the bus a lot and I, I run into people like, we didn't know you guys were still alive. I'm like, what? It's 2015, you know, and uh, we're all around us. You know, the, this is all native land <laughs> that you're on. And, uh, you know, get to know your neighbor. It, uh, those kind of things, you know, I can't believe still exist in this time. And, um, you know, and yes, yeah, so we we basically go on Twitter and Facebook, and particularly on Twitter, we do these Twitter storms. In fact, we're doing one right now um, about the whole uh, Netflix, um, paying, you know, sponsoring the Adam Sandler movie, the eighty million dollar Adam Sandler movie, which has really degrading scenes of Native women, and. Um, and of course, we're tying it into the issue of domestic violence against Native women, and um, it's it's. I mean, I read the script. I mean, the script was leaked to um, Gawker a few days ago, and I just can't believe that anyone signed off on this. It's it's so bad. I mean, I I, I haven't seen a lot of Adam Sandler stuff, but this is worse than anything I've ever seen. Yeah. And that he feels like you know he can have that loyalty with Native women um, says a lot. And I mean, he has. Native women flashing their privates at white men, having alcohol poured on them while they're laying drunk on the ground, all for laughs, mm -hmm. you know, and peeing in front of white men on teepees, holding peace pipes, you know, the sacred chanupa. It's absolutely, I mean, it's amazing. I, I mean, really, I just, it's unbelievable. It, I, yeah, when you're just talking about it, it makes me, uh, I, I can't believe that, that somebody could write a script like that and then get away with bringing it to the screen so how can we i mean ourselves other than uh i, I saw that there was a, a petition that was out there for for um uh, was it the zuckerman I, I did that what, what else can we do well i mean i think that um i really do feel like we we need to stay united um in social media, um, Native people do stand together. I think writing articles is really important, getting um, radio shows like this, getting the Native perspective out there. Um, you know, uh, Kayla wrote, um, Kayla and Delore have both written really great articles this past week on these issues, um, you know, in Indian Country Today and the Goodman Project and um, and Native News. Um, and uh, I think that we, that, needs to continue um we really with our group we with you know and we try to promote native people to write get them published um because you know until we're seeing until other people see the world through our eyes and see you know see us um see um see us as the protagonists in films you know we can't have films where we are the second banana even our own stories are told that way you know where it's the white guy and it's his perspective on us and um, that has to change. It has to. The films have to have native protagonists. Books have to have native protagonists. And the world needs to be seen through our eyes so that fellow Americans um, can see us as human beings right. um, and, and living today, not in the past. Yeah, these kind of uh, films. These are uh, what uh, I don't know. They add to the suicide rate of our young people. 
Yeah, I, I saw that quote from the, um, the Navajo actress who walked off the set of the Adam Sandler movie where she said that her brother, um, her brother as a teenager had committed suicide, and his reason was because it's so hard to be um, brown and, and talented in this world. And, um, and that's what she was thinking of when she refused to participate in these stereotypes. So, um, you know, people know that they're listening to KAOS 89.3 FM and here in Olympia. I, I, I'm really at a loss for words because this kind of stuff, I really, I can't believe that it still exists today and that, that people, um, People allow what allow it to happen, and I do agree with you that n- more Native people have to start telling their stories and coming to the forefront and and uh, uh, sharing their own identity of who they are as a people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that um, I think um, maybe Delora explain more about her petition and and how that played out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to also mention in terms of the, the headdress, um, I come from a Plains culture where the headdress is worn by our leadership, and it's something that you have to earn. It's not like any member of the, of the nation can, can wear that. It has to actually be transferred to you with prayers, and it's definitely something that you're, you're recognized by the whole community. Because um, I know that was one of the, that was, that was one of um, some of the backlash that we were getting from the Biloxi alumni. Um, with within now, now I believe the petition is up to. I th- there's a, almost 1,100 signatures on there, and um, we have we have people signing from all across Canada and the United States as well. Um, and um, I, I think it's also really important that because a lot of these images are just they're one dimensional, and we we need to re- reappropriate the images. Um, we need to take control of our images. And it's been a long-standing tradition that First Nations and Native Americans aren't in charge of our own image or our history. Um, it goes back to when anthropological um, photographers um, were taking pictures of us, and um, history is usually only told from, from one side. So um, I know one thing that we did um, that, that we, we thought was really important was really um, getting to know the, the history of the of the. Biloxi Nation, and Kayla's done a really wonderful job um, doing research around that, and perhaps maybe I can um, hand that off to her. And that's why we're, we're also really happy um, Kayla was able to reach out um, to Jean um, to get um, to get that perspective as well. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I do have a lot of information. Um, unfortunately, we were hoping that our allied residents with Biloxi could provide us with more information, but the local library in Mississippi, I've been informed, is closed until Tuesday on account of a celebration of a Confederate holiday. Um, kind of ironic, but so I'm going to try to go through quickly the information that I did get to provide a little background um, and to give time for Jean-Luc to also present his perspective. Um, but my, in my experience thus far with the Biloxi mascot issue, our outspoken advocates are nearly always alumni of the Biloxi school system. Uh, I find this kind of frustrating considering that we're dealing with the present. But in short, these folks need to let go and stop telling us that we have more important things to worry about, especially when we're considering how these are affecting our youth. And these are alumni who are really just talking about their pride in, in their schools that they've been through. Um, and every single piece of evidence that they provided as to why they should continue to be the Biloxi Indians revolves around their history with the Biloxi tribe, how they're honoring the tribe, and how they're receiving the headdress or permission to use the symbol from the tribe, and their confidence in how their tradition will be easily defended by the Tunica Biloxi tribe as soon as they hear back from them. Um, but many of these same alumni, the ones that have been attacking the warrior online, they don't They'll say that even the Biloxi people don't have the blood quantum to substantiate an important tribal voice, and that they would they would like to hear from them that it doesn't really matter, um, and that that kind of disturbs me, especially considering how many people claim to have Native blood who make this argument, and yet the demographics of both Ocean Springs and Biloxi, Mississippi, show that predominantly white people inhabit these cities, and even out of the fraction of Native population that is there, that is self-proclaimed indigenous peoples in both cities. Um, but regardless, 
I have a little history here about the school, and then hopefully uh, Jean-Luc can fill us in a little bit more about his history of his tribe and his opinions on the situation. Um, but opin- according to the uh, Biloxi Wikipedia page, it's the, the third largest Mississippian city behind Jackson and Gulfport um, until Hurricane Katrina, and now it's the fifth. Um, and Biloxi was derived from Fort Biloxi in French, which is another name for Fort Maurepa. Ocean Springs is a neighboring city along the Mississippi and Gulf Coast. It also has a Wikipedia page that declares that seafood has been celebrated as its heritage, but neither the Biloxi page nor the Ocean Springs page really make any mention of Indian people as being part of the history of their cities. The Biloxi city homepage also fails to mention the importance of the tribe to its existence. Um, instead, it notes the eight flags that have flown there, being the French, English, Spanish, Republic of Western Florida, Confederate States of America, United States of America, Magnolia State, and current Mississippi State flags. It does say that Biloxi was inhabited by Native Americans as early as 8,000 B.C., um, up until the 1700s. And it also states that the first French and French Canadians to arrive in, um, were in 1699, that they became friends with the Biloxi Indians, but there's no documentation of this. It also says that the people there spoke the Sioux language, which has no explication with it, um, and that they most likely migrated from the Northeast. And it also indicates that there is some indication that they lived there, they arrived there shortly before the French. So really there's no history provided. Um, Ocean Springs, though, is very close to the city, and they actually used to be called Old Biloxi, which they explain on their on their website. And they say that New Biloxi, which is currently Biloxi, essentially was abandoned after the capital of Louisiana was moved to New Orleans in 1722. Um, so basically, time and time again, there were people that inhabited here in the 1720s, but a lot of this area was abandoned and not continuously populated. Um, so there was no continued relationship with indigenous peoples in this area. And in 1763, land east of the Mississippi River was ceded to England. And the Treaty of Paris in 1783 gave British West Florida to Spain, and Spain held this land until 1810 when the Republic of West Florida was declared. In 1811, this became the United States, and Mississippi entered the Union in 1817, bringing in a lot of Americans and immigrants who came to work for as seamen and laborers, in the ocean industry and the seafood industry. Um, And in fact, this became the reason why Ocean Springs was renamed from Old Biloxi. Uh, So basically, time and time again, we see there's no representation of the indigenous peoples. And even within the Historical Society website, the only mention of Indians exists under the athletic section and then the timeline is when they talk about when the name change occurred. There's no mention throughout the 1800s of these people However, we learn by the Daily Herald in a publication that in fall of 1926 that the Biloxi High School changed their moniker from the Yellow Jackets to the Redskins. So not only did they go from the Yellow Jackets in the 1920s during a time that was not very perspective of Native peoples as human beings, but they changed it to a racial slur. Um, and there's no declaration on that website of when they actually adopted the name Indian, but it over time became used, and in fact, some publications use the word Indian um, to say that the Biloxi Indians add big, thick, crowned titles. So I have countless documentations of publications where not only do they prove that this was in no way anything that was meant to be honorable, um, but they used racial slurs and they use quotes like in 1927, the Biloxi Indians run wild over the Moss Pointers, and it's, it's all sports oriented. It has nothing to do with honoring the tribe and no education about the tribe itself. Not only that, but the, the city continues to be incredibly racially segregated until the 1960s. Um, and uh, a mention is even made on the website that so the class of 1961 was the last one of, in the old school system that neither saw air, nor air conditioning nor any integration at the point in its existence. Um, and even in Tunica Vilexi's recommendation for federally recognized tribal status to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they talk about their history and about the different tribes um, that are now part of the Tunica Vilexi. And at no point do they make mention to any of the relationships with 
the school or with this town or even any history of being in that area at that point. Um, and I, I don't want to talk on feeling about it because there's a lot of history. Instead, I'd rather pass this on to Jean-Luc and, and ask, what, what do you have to say about the way that Biloxi High School is honoring your people and your history and, and how accurate is that? Hmm. <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, the, the honor uh, if there is any intended, is, is not just uh, from my people alone. The Biloxi bloodline actually um, continues on, not just in the Tunica Biloxi, but there is uh, the state-recognized uh, tribe, uh, recognized by the state of Louisiana, the uh, Biloxi, Chinamacha, Choctaw. There's a couple of communities in southeast Louisiana right now. So if there is any honor to be given it's it's not just to, to me but to but to others as well but one thing that i you know take uh take offense towards as far as using the using the eagle feather headdress and the uh the band's uniform is you know this the outer communities you know this sort of inclination to sort of treat native americans as as a sort of monolithic culture and that that's just uh, completely not so um you know, I, I wrote a letter to the editors of the Sun Herald, and this was actually uh, it was a, a, an odd uh, sequence of events because uh, one, what really incensed me about the whole situation was the headline that came out of the Sun Herald that said uh, the Biloxi Indians are not complaining about you know about this issue, and that immediately I, I was just like I needed to to write something I needed to tell, you know, my my side of the story, my family's side of the story. And um, it's just a coincidence that, you know, once I press send, then I get a, a tweet from Kayla saying, hey, do you want to do something? I said, I just did, you know. And so I forwarded her as a, as an email. And, um, but this, the Eagle Feather Headdress in the context of, of the Tunica Biloxi uh, is something that's actually specific to my family. Uh, because it's not something that is a traditional Biloxi headdress, although our our language is Tulin. Um, because our our because our language is Tulin, because uh, my great grandfather made friends uh, during the uh, the journey to settle recognition, he made friends with uh, people such as Vine Deloria. You know, we we've maintained contact, we maintain ties with the Lakota people, and through that. Um, the eagle feather headdress was gifted to my great grandfather, and he wore it as our chief. And after him, my uh, grandfather wore it as our first chairman. Um, and since then, uh, our, our leaders uh, we've had uh, three uh, chairmen since my grandfather, and and none of them have have worn the the eagle feather headdress. It's actually uh, in sort of uh, resting right now. And, uh, Northwestern University in Natchitoches, Louisiana, but um, but yeah, it's it's something that's very specific. It's it's nothing that um, that we we all uh, claim to wear in my tribe. So you know, and and two, going back to the Bloxy Chinamacha, you know, they're you know as as far as like somebody honoring them or doing something for them to sort of give them a hand up, you know, they they're struggling right now. Uh, they, you know, need resources to, you know, prove the case that to actually get the federally recognized status. And also they're, they're living in southeast Louisiana, coastal Louisiana, which is losing land faster than any other place in the world. You know, they, they're basically going to be without a home. And so whatever this, whatever this band is doing, it is not, you know, helping the people that it is, you know, said to honor and, and help. They, they certainly weren't there to help with the federal recognition either, were they? No, 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 they weren't. And, and oh, from what no, I've heard, that's and, and, then I will, and I will actually kind of tack on really quickly. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the Biloxi coming, possibly coming from the Northeast. There is uh, documentation. There's a book called uh, The Raconte sur la Mississippi. It's in French, of course. But uh, it actually uh, it actually says that the French uh, explorers did meet the Biloxi uh, there, and that actually they were able to communicate with each other because uh, the tribe and the French, um, for 
I, and I'm not really sure if, if they just mean that uh, the language of, of Indians or, you know, if this is actually true, but, you know, the French said that the Biloxi spoke Iroquois when they met them at, at you know, the place that we know as Biloxi. So it is possible that they, that they, they came from the Northeast. But, um, but as far as the, the tribe's specific language, it is from the Siouan language family. You know, what I find very interesting is that, uh, and I've said this this whole week, and it's funny that you guys are talking about this, how the American view of Native people only goes bar- back so far, far, and then they forget. You know, like, uh, yeah. we live here, and, I, you know, I think they said that I, where I work in Tumwater was discovered by somebody else, and I'm like, what about, what? That's Nisqually's land. What happened to yeah. that history? Before yeah. before everybody got here, it just uh, it's well, very selective. Yeah, we. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I just want to jump in one more time. Um, you know, we we not too far removed from being enemies of the state of the United States of America. It was, it was the late 19th century when Geronimo finally su- uh, surrendered, um, and then the early it was like 1905. I think it was. Uh, it was one of the president's uh, inauguration parade. He marched in to show, like you know, how civilized he had become since being captured. And it was only until the 1920s that we were actually granted citizenship uh, to this country. So you know, when Caleb brings about the dates of you know the Biloxi Redskins, and then I think about you know when we actually got citizenship, it's it, it might it might be a, a bit of a coincidence, but then uh, um, I'm also you know leaning towards the fact that they you know we weren't uh, um, the best buddies not too long ago. So, and I'm, I'm going to bet to say that most of the people that are defending this mascot have absolutely no idea about anything that we all just talked about right now. Too, that's another huge point to make. I think. Well, that's, yeah. that's why it's important for us to have this dialogue. We just got a few more minutes, but I just wanted to give everybody a chance that, that um, to say what... I know we've been talking, but I always uh, say with myself that there's something on your heart that, that we haven't talked about. If we can just uh, share that within a couple minutes, that would be great. And uh, how people can get involved is really important. Um, I, I just like to say that for, for me... Um, I really want to try any way that I can to help create a different story for the younger generation. And so that's why I felt the need to do something more. And, and um, so if anyone, if you haven't signed the petition, please do. It's um, on change.org. And you can also um, find it on uh, find me on Facebook, uh, Deloria Many Gray Horses. And I can share more information on that. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess um, you can definitely um, join our Facebook group, um, Eradicating Offensive Native Mascot Traits. And uh, we, we really um, coordinate a lot out of that group. It is um, a closed group because we were being harassed a lot by uh, mascot supporters. And so, um, but please feel free to join. And, um, and yeah, we keep each other, you know, um, in touch about issues and, um, and coordinate. I think... Um, Working together is the most important thing, and getting our voices out there um, is really important. And uh, and I, I have to say that uh, meeting all these amazing Native people from across the country um, has been really a real um, a real blessing. I mean, every time I turn around, there there's more Native students and Native parents standing up and and passing laws to to change things in their in their communities. And it, it's been such an inspiration. Thank you. Um, I think the thing that I have to add is after protesting this year at the demonstration in Cleveland, I came to realize how many different allies came to our side um, to something that personally affected me. And it kind of made me realize I'll be really passionate about things that affect me, but how often am I passionate about things that don't necessarily seem to directly affect me? Um, And I kind of realized I would be so willing to stand up for any of my allies' causes, but I've never actually done that in person. And I think that's an important thing to remember, too, just because you don't think that something directly affects you, well, first of all, it probably indirectly does because the equality of everybody is important to all of our equalities. 
Um, but also it's important for us to stand up for people who we can be allies to and to make just a little bit of difference because everyone's little bit goes a really long way in some. So that's that's all I have to add to that. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, <clears throat> my mom, my sister, and I are uh, singers and legend keepers for our tribe and um, and doing the work of language and culture preservation. One of the one of the hardest things to overcome is that the fear and the confusion that even our tribal members get from the, the, the disconnect of, of the culture. We're, we're trying to reclaim it. We're trying to inform ourselves of, of who we are and remember who we are and trying to pick up the pieces. And the worst, the worst thing that we have right now are the stereotypes, the mascots, everything that's out there that you know, looks Indian and causes confusion for our membership. We need to we need to do away with that and you know get back to healing, get back to remembering who we are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Is that everybody? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I think so. I, I, I so really appreciate really taking time on a half an hour. It goes really fast, and uh, hopefully we could do this again. We have a little bit more time, and I appreciate everyone's words and uh it really is time to to take back the identity and to our our own people need to start telling the stories of who they are and i think that's uh really super important so thank you thanks for having us thank Thank you thank you everybody we'll talk soon okay See see you later You've tuned into KAOS 89.3 Olympia. Let's just make no bones about it. And uh, I just want to reiterate a little bit about what we've been talking about the last hour. And I, I've said this myself um, many times, but the story needs to go back further than the Eurocentric viewpoint. And uh, that story, the beginning story, needs to be told. And think only native people can do that so thank you for tuning in to kos 89.3 fm the following commentary does not necessarily reflect the views of the staff and management of kaos or the evergreen state college if you would like to express another opinion we invite you to address your comments to kaos cab 101 the evergreen state college 2700 evergreen parkway northwest olympia washington 98505 To arrange a time for your own commentary, call KAOS at 360-867-6888 during regular weekday business hours or email at kaos at evergreen.edu. This song is the American Indian Movement National Anthem Song. This song was adopted in 1972 in Gordon, Nebraska the American Indian Movement went there to protest the judicial handling of an Indian's death. His name was Raymond Yellow Thunder. The song was originally dedicated to the Yellow Thunder family, but because of the story behind it, the Northern Cheyenne people gave this song 